had a wonderful uh, se seminar. My feeling was that the three days were really uh, worth it, attending. And you can see that uh, futures have a risk of falling between the chairs. Oh, this is an amazing, very luxurious format. I mean, we really have the time to listen to one another and we have the time to talk to one another and we have to, the great chance to meet all of these people. I've really started to see new ways to do my own work and I will take that back as action within my team. Knowledge in Space has been a remarkable and enduring and long-term program that has been generously supported and enabled by the Klaus Tira Foundation. We as the Department of Geography at the University of Heidelberg are very grateful for this opportunity. The cycle is closing after more than one and a half decades with this 20th symposium on knowledge in space. We, rather than looking backward, really want to take a view ahead of us into the future. A diverse and exciting international group of scholars has come to Heidelberg to debate the big questions. How can we understand the future? How can we anticipate the future? What types and techniques for envisioning alternative futures are there and how do we engage with those academically? And finally, once we do perceive desirable or feared futures, how do they impact on our actions in the present? One of the first books I read that got me interested in this whole idea of exploring the future talked about a lack of positive guiding images. His point was successful societies and civilizations of the past were united by this idea of a common future that they were aspiring to reach. And he was lamenting the absence in the present. And so part of my contribution, I hope, as a futurist is to add some ideas into that mix. So I've created three images that I offer as candidates. Each image sort of has a different emphasis. So in the circular commons, we talk about a world where environmentalism is a, really a, a driving force of daily life. The second image, the non-workers paradise, as it implies, says we have figured out a way to separate the distribution of wealth without needing a job. The third image, tech-led abundance, says that you know, all the technologies that we hear about, AI, big data, robotics, automation, and so on, are successful. So what do I mean by utopias of extinction? I've been talking about a sort of a transformation of utopian thought, adapting to the idea that the world ends while history goes on. Insofar as we have history, we have utopian thought, and utopian thought is adapted to this condition also taking on board the possibility that in case humans, as in a lot of discussions around climate change and environmental degradations are stating it, so in as much as humans are the malaise of the planet and of planetary life, and in as much as we think now that the world can end and yet history could go on, then utopia or betterment must mean phasing out human existence. What I try to do in my work is draw attention to the fact that most of the social sciences have neglected the future. We are all forced currently, because of all the crises that we are living through, to deal with it, but we also have to conceptualize it. As an anthropologist, I do ethnographic empirical work in cities that are post-industrial. That means that they were built for an era which was determined by labor and the relations that come with that and also the expectations that come with that. Everybody had a job and they knew they would go to the factory, they would go to the mines and they would just continue with their work and that was giving security. They've lost that. They're now post-industrial, that means they also have lost the future. The cities do not know where they are going and the communities living in it, they have to get a new take on these futures because they've been rendered problematic, because there's a presumption that they have lost them. So-called community-supported aquacultures, which might be an articulation of post-growth practices. It's fascinating to study, to understand, and to distill the novelty in those approaches. What kind of innovations, and by innovation I mean social innovations as much as technological innovations, of how to organize agriculture, for example, emerge from those activities, and how can other sectors learn from those innovations? 
But scenarios are very different. They're much more presenting and developing a broad picture of the future to do with societal change, technological change, economic change, political change. And so when you're building scenarios for the future, you'll build a qualitative pen picture of the way the world might be different, say 10, 15 years from now. And then you can maybe test your decisions against these scenarios to see if a decision you're making, an investment or a, a priority is robust against the different scenarios. I think there is a, a tendency to try and convince the politicians, but also behind the politicians, the public, with scientific facts. I'm not saying that these are not important, they are crucial but they don't have the power of persuasion that aspirational futures have. So I would call for much more academic, but also societal work on how we can create these sustainable worlds of the future. And sometimes actually, that can also be done by showcasing instances of the present where you say, well, this is a bit how you can imagine that the future life would be. I did a book, for instance, on neighborhoods for the future which highlights neighborhoods that exist already now, but that perform on a really high sustainability standard. And that helps because then people say, oh, is that what you mean? Well, that's not, that's not too bad. And then, you know, they have the psychological sort of hurdle overcome and, and they can actually move towards that future. In fact, design architecture, it's loaded with power, with uh, possibilities for social control and steering. And that's the case not only in architecture, but in less uh, spatial disciplines like design, where we create images of the future. We try to persuade people. We make powerful images, spaces, experiences, which have the potential to determine how people can live or opportunities for people to have in future life. So for me, I like to say design as governance, because I want we in design to really take that and, and examine that and be more critical, reflexive, and intentional about the responsibility we have when we make choices designing spaces and images that have this power to control others or to somehow shape the future. I would like to study more in the future is thinking about how we predict and respond to specific catastrophes. So that could be a volcanic eruption, that could be a fire, that could be a heat wave, for example. Often, People who live in a particular environment can foresee how bad those would be, could see that they're going to happen perhaps in advance. And so this gap between the kinds of knowledge we know exists on the ground and the kinds of knowledge we use to make decisions is really clearly dangerous to people. Dangerous because they are not getting the resources and the response in time to help them survive catastrophe. So the idea of a waking up to crisis has been explored across different disciplinary traditions and what I think they share is this moment of a realisation of distance from an ideal um, reality, which I think is quite interesting. So it's not necessarily a moment of simply enlightenment and, and arriving at a truth, but realising of a distance from an ideal. I think waking up is also expresses something of an activation of agency. It's an effective awakening, so the capacity to sense, to feel bodily these crisis presence in the future. Look at the future through the lens of food. We can learn that perhaps we are able to change the future of food and somehow the future of humanity if we perform differently as consumers of food. We should engage more with uh, primary producers on farms and we should also perhaps be more responsible when we choose the food outlets where we buy our food and we should be also more engaged with other consumers to cooperate with them in order to change all the values which flow along the value chain. KIPS means knowledge intensive business services and KIPS are very important shapers the way in which our economies develop and our societies develop. Now, what sorts of solutions do they come up with? One of the big challenges that we have right now is sustainability. They have to confront, they have to use knowledge to provide those problems. Who's going to supply them with the knowledge? Hibs are the mechanism we have for doing that. Can we outrun the disaster? I'm not so sure we can outrun it. What I think we're going to have to do is to adapt to it, put in place mitigations to avoid the worst, 
So I think we do need to change what we do now and into the future. So this symposium is a terrific forum, as I suspected, but it's even it's turned out better than I thought in terms of really um, helping me to strengthen my own thinking. And what was really nice about this seminar is to see how we could actually connect, grow ties between these different approaches of the future. We are very happy to use the facilities of Klaus Chira Foundation and would like to thank for 16 years of very engaged international academic dialogue. <laughs>